This is episode 69 of Cinescope, and tis the season to be jolly and joyous. Welcome to Cinescope, where our goal is not to criticize or to assign ratings, but rather to celebrate the movies we love, exploring story, characters, music, and relevance to the world around us. I'm your host, Chad Hopkins, and joining me today is Rachel Herrick to talk about one of our favorite films, The Muppet Christmas Carol. Rachel, how are you doing tonight? Yay! I'm so excited. Hey, Chad, how are you doing? I'm doing well. It's been a long time since we've talked. I know, it has. It feels like... I don't know. How long has it been? Like a year or maybe? Uh, a a or? little more than a year. Uh, I think you well, you were on for the Muppets episode, and that was in the teens, if I remember correctly, maybe. Uh, so okay, yeah. it's been a while, uh, but uh, I'm excited to have you back. I wouldn't think of talking about a Muppets movie with anyone else, really. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm so excited. This is like my favorite Muppet film ever, so I couldn't be happier. Well, that's great to hear since last time we talked about my favorite Muppet film ever. <laughs> so uh, how about you reintroduce yourself? Tell everybody out there who you are, what you do, anything like that. Sure. I mean, right now it feels like, what don't I do? <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Herrick. Um, some of you may know me online as Adorkable Rachel. I run a YouTube channel where I talk about movies and things I'm passionate about. And one thing people seem to come back to is my talk about the Muppets. I love talking Muppets or anything from Jim Henson. And also in my regular life, I am a puppeteer. I do shows around Southern California. I toured earlier this year in a production. And I've done some stuff in Los Angeles for or a TV and film as well. And also I do voice acting. So again, bit of everything here and there. And of course, being the holidays, I feels like I'm all over the place doing everything. Right. You said you had a show earlier this evening. So we uh, started a little bit later than normal. No problem here. But it's cool that you're doing all the things apparently. Yeah, I basically, um, I did a puppet show out in um, northern LA, and then I came straight here and just put all my stuff down and said, all right, let's start recording. Well, thank you for being here, and uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Nothing really to cover, so let's just go ahead and jump into it. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay, so we are talking about The Muppet Christmas Carol. It was released on December 11th of 1992, so we just celebrated its 25th anniversary, which is insane. Uh, that is crazy. <laughs> it was directed by Brian Henson, who also directed Muppet Treasure Island, Jack and the Beanstalk, The Real Story, and is set to direct the upcoming The Happy Time Murders, which is another puppetry film, I believe. Um, and it's the first film directed by Brian, I believe, in the Muppet franchise after his father's death in 1990. Uh, the script was written by Jerry Joel and was based on the classic story A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. The score album is by Miles Goodman, who also composed scores for Teen Wolf, Little Shop of Horrors, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, What About Bob, House Sitter, Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit. And the songs were composed by Paul Williams, who did work on the original The Muppet movie, including the song The Rainbow Connection. The movie stars Michael Caine as Scrooge, as well as Stephen McIntosh, Meredith Braun, Robin Weaver, and Muppet performers Dave Goles, Steve Whitmire, Jerry Nelson, Frank Oz, David Rudman, Karen Prell, Robert Tegner, William Todd Jones, and Don Austin. So we always start off, Rachel, with our first experience. Do you remember your first experience with this movie? I do not, actually. <laughs> um, I don't remember the first time that I watched this. Um, I don't believe I saw this in the theaters because it was released in 1992 and I mean, me, I don't think I did. Um, I don't think I saw it in the movie theaters, but I always remember having a copy of the VHS and we watched it every year, I think, as far back as I can remember. So I wouldn't be surprised if my family got the VHS like not long after it was released and we just always watched it. It was just one of those things we had a box um, with all of our Christmas decorations, like a box just full of VHSs of different um, specials and stuff that was taped and movies and that was always one of the ones I always made sure to watch every year. So to answer your question, no, I do not. But I always remember watching it and loving it. That's a pretty common theme for these films that came out in like 
for the example of you and me, when we were probably pretty young. Uh, so we, we mm-hmm. it's just movies that we've always known. They've always been around. But that being said, I didn't really grow up with this movie. Um, I maybe saw it once or twice as a kid, but it wasn't one that we owned. Um, my, oh, interesting. Yeah, my Muppets experience as a child came from Muppet Treasure Island. That's the one that I owned on VHS and watched all the time. And I didn't really come into the Muppets in general until I was a little bit older. And uh, of course, I love them now. They're some of my favorite things in the world. But mm-hmm. um, I I truly do appreciate this movie for being a fantastic adaptation of the Charles Dickens book, which is something I try to read every year. Don't always get to it, but it is an important part of my Christmas. And this is one of my favorite adaptations, if not my favorite adaptation. Um, you know, being a fan of Muppet Treasure Island and it being a sort of Muppetization of a classic novel by Robert Louis Stevenson, um, this is the same sort of thing with Charles Dickens. It's just a Muppetization of a Christmas classic, but it's still the same story everybody already knows. And I think looking back, what's more important, as I mentioned, is this is the first big, true Muppet, Muppets effort without Jim Henson. So you have a new person playing Kermit, you have Brian Henson helming the movie, and there was just a lot riding on this movie in retrospect. And if it hadn't worked, it's interesting to consider where the Muppets would be today. Mm-hmm. Very true. Very true. And I think um, it's actually interesting. I think if you look at the history of it, I don't think it did quite as well as um, as they had hoped it would. I mean, I, it definitely made money, but I don't think that it was like the box office success that they were hoping for. And um, I, I'm surprised that that led to them making Muppet Treasure Island. And I, it feels like they were kind of on a roll with this like wave of like, let's do like historical texts with the Muppets. That sounds like actually a really cool idea. And of course, this one started all of that. And it's such a great idea because this one was, you know, such an, uh, a success. Like, even if it um wasn't such a success in the theaters, it definitely has grown a following over the years. Like so many people remember watching this. So many people remember this also being their introduction to Christmas Carol. And I'm not going to lie. I think it might have been mine too, because I don't remember watching a lot of Christmas Carol specials when I was younger, but I always remember watching this one. And I think that's one of the most important things about it playing in people's childhoods is that, again, it's an introduction to a Christmas Carol, but it's such a great introduction. And even Dickens historians have said that the Muppets, believe it or not, is the closest adaptation that most have ever seen, which is pretty incredible. So not only did they do a great job of making such a wonderful movie, but they succeeded in capturing the spirit of Dickens' novel. And that is just so cool to me. I just think that's the coolest thing. Right. I mean, my Christmas Carol movie as a kid was the 23, 27-minute long Mickey's Christmas Carol. Um, mm. I had that on VHS along with the Disney sing-along, I believe it was. And so that's what I grew up with. And like I said, it's only 20 something minutes long. So it was a big difference to come to a movie like this that is feature length and is able to give the story a little bit more time than it would yeah. in that, that 20 minute framework. So I like the the extra time that is spent. I like having the the extra little moments that we get through the song and the the dance or not much dance, but you know what I mean? The, the, the whole pomp of it all, uh, it yeah. just works really well with the still a short runtime, but of course longer than 20 minutes. Oh yeah. And you know, actually it's funny you bring up the Mickey Mouse one because I recently watched that again, not long ago. And you're absolutely right. We were even talking about this with my friends that that one actually even did a great job of, you know, creating this spirit of Dickens, even though it's only 20 minutes long. But I think that Muppets works a little better because, like you said, it's a little longer. Mm -hmm. It gives you a little more time to kind of, like, include the things that were important to Scrooge's journey. Um, Nothing against the Mickey one. I love the Mickey one. But, um, yeah. Um, And, yeah, I I think you're right also um, about it just has this... um, this energy to it. It um it really takes the time. Something else that's such a strong point of that movie is it really takes the time to just kind of absorb the atmosphere mm-hmm. of the sets and just the Dickens era. Even though a lot of the time it's kind of sort of obviously a set, it just kind of works, you know? Right. And one of my favorite parts of the film even is they took the time to make sure that the buildings in the movie were like down to scale. So it looked like that both, you know, the Muppet characters and people kind of coexisted together, which I think also adds a lot to the movie. Just, you can totally believe that this world is alive just from the set design. Yeah. The set design is fantastic. And I, 
from the very first shots of the movie as we're getting the overture by Miles Goodman and then we transition into the introduction of Charles Dickens and Rizzo, um, <laughs> it's very firmly Dickensian London. I mean, it, it's it we just automatically get into that time period very easily. Um, but then we automatically also know that it's a Muppet film, not just because we see Muppets, but also because we get the Muppet humor right off the bat. We see these two gentlemanly pig characters saying to each other how great a meal they just had. And then what now? Lunch? Okay. And so they go off to lunch right <laughs> after finishing their breakfast or whatever it might be. And then we get the the street vendor selling a turkey that's still alive and has the name Martin. And then you have Lou throwing his boomerang fish and mm-hmm. all these very classic Muppet characters that you already see in the background, but also just the Muppet humor that lets you know that, yes, this is, this is Dickens. This is a Christmas Carol, but we're going to have some fun with it. Yeah. It's really smart that they smart started off that way too. Like you get that like nice Christmassy kind of music, but then you get Muppets in the foreground. And by the way, my favorite um, out of all those little jokes in the beginning is the vegetables that are getting stolen out of the carriage. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we're being stolen. I'm being stolen. Help me. Help me. <laughs> you know, it, just, and it, just, it just cracks me up. Well, even when uh, Gonzo slash Dickens first show up with uh, Rizzo and they're selling apples and Rizzo is eating the apples because he says he's creating scarcity to increase demand. <laughs> um, <laughs> this movie sort of introed Gonzo and Rizzo as a duo. And I, we only really got Muppet Treasure Island after that uh, with that duo. I wish we had a lot more of them because they're so funny throughout the film. They are. They are. Um, yeah, the, I always remember thinking, I think I always remember that Gonzo and Rizzo were just a pair. And I was always kind of sad we didn't see more of that. Like you definitely see them, you know, kind of together in other things, especially in like the most recent television show. Like, but it was always like them and Pepe, which isn't bad. But I always just liked them as a team. And I always thought that they worked off each other so well. Agreed. And uh, just speaking more to the the set design of everything, th- there's some memorable cinematography too. Like the the one shot that really stands out in my mind, and they've used this for DVD covers and posters or whatever, what have you, where Kermit's uh, standing on the streets at dusk or at night, and he's looking up at the stars and uh, the moon, and it's just him standing there by himself, and he's just satisfied with life, and it's Christmas time, and he's off work, and it's just a, a great shot of Kermit just standing in solitude but being content. Um, mm-hmm. But then also we have the little, um, I, I guess you could call them cameos, even though they're not traditional cameos, but you have like on the street signs or on the the storefronts, you have Statler and Waldorf, which are the, mm-hmm. the name of the Muppets who play the Marleys. And then you have a place called Micklewhites, which is a callback to uh, Michael Caine's real name, which is Maurice Micklewhite. Uh, right. Yeah. Just all these like little Easter egg references. Yeah. That's the right yeah, word for I it. Love Easter that kind egg. Of stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's so great. And uh, this isn't exclusive to Muppet Christmas Carol, but I, I just love the idea of the Muppets being considered as actual actors. So in the opening credits, you get Kermit the Frog as Bob Cratchit. And Gonzo as Charles Dickens. And instead of listing the the Muppet performers right off the bat, you get those in the end credits. But at the beginning, it's just like, this is Kermit. And in this movie, he's playing this. And then the fact that Dickens himself is included as a narrator and Rizzo argues a point and it it it's a great example of the Muppets breaking the fourth wall very early on. And it makes me think of how this is almost like a teleplay in that sense where they're all aware that they're playing characters aside from themselves. But Mm Gonzo is really the only one who truly breaks the fourth wall in that sense. Which I always found interesting too. I mean, maybe I think that that helps in the long run because it really adds to, you know, the reality of the story that, you know, it's not like Kermit looks to the camera and says something to the audience. He never does that. I'm just surprised they never did that because that would seem like something the Muppets would do, but they never do that. And um, I guess it was for the better, but it would have been interesting if they did. Um, Yeah, I love that we've got Rizzo and Gonzo who are just kind of telling the story for us. And I think kind of sort of going back to the um, the whole, you know, Dickens historian saying that this is why... the, it, it's so close to the original novel. It's closer. I think that the reason why is because Gonzo adds so much to it. He's there, like, reading the exact text from the book. 
and kind of just giving us this idea of how, you know, people talked by then, back then. And again, just adding to the atmosphere of it. Um, it's hard to add anything onto that, but I just love that. I think that that adds so much to it is having Dickens right there just kind of saying everything and explaining everything that's happening for, to us. Yeah, I do love the inclusion of the original book's dialogue. Uh, I think that adds so much because it's not uh, it's not so old that it feels aged in a sense. I mean, you, it's not Shakespearean. It's not Shakespearean. That's a good way of putting it where it, it is still able to be understood pretty easily. Um and a lot of times they'll say a line and then they'll maybe say it a little bit differently in a more modern sense so that it's a little bit more palatable to younger audiences, especially. But I mean, you've got classic Christmas Carol lines like come in and know me better, man, or any st- I mean, stuff like that, where it, it mm-hmm. just they do such a great job of being reverential of the source material, but still making it their own. Yeah. And then you've also, I think, and you got Rizzo there saying, how do you know all this? Like, <laughs> when have you ever seen, we've seen lots of things where the narrator is like there telling us a story, but when have you ever had someone say, how do you know that? You know, I think that <laughs> that's so Muppety to me too. Like, I've never seen a character, you know, just get called out <laughs> for being a narrator. And I love it. Um, yeah, that was a, a great little Muppet, Muppety kind of tidbit that I just think added a lot to as well. Because, you know, he's kind of, Rizzo's just there for comedy relief, and mm-hmm. it could have gone horribly, but he works so well in this movie, I think just because him and Gonzo work off each other so, so incredibly well. I, I agree. Um, well, let's go on to Scrooge, uh, talk characters a little yes. bit more specifically, because, I mean, Scrooge is the meat of the film for obvious reasons. It's nice to... Muppet Treasure Island does this as well, where we're telling a classic story featuring the Muppets, and Kermit's always been head honcho when it comes to Muppets, but he's sort of the sideline character in this one and in Muppet Treasure Island, and I actually really like that. Uh, I like that we're focusing on a human character living within this Muppet world, and Michael Caine is just fantastic. He fits in with the Muppets so well without feeling like he's going too far or not far enough. He just Mm -hmm. fits. He really does. I mean, I don't, it's still hard to this day how to describe his performance and why it works so well, but he just is Scrooge, it feels like. He's not like an angry curmudgeon and, but he just is just, he just feels like a man, I guess, who has just been drained for all the years and is just, you know, had all the joy sucked out of him and you just, I just totally buy it. And again, you're right. He's not so serious that he doesn't match with the Muppets. There's just something about him that just kind of keeps up with the Muppets, I feel like. like he, He's definitely very opposite of all the Muppet characters for a good chunk of the movie, but he just melds with them so well. They're very different movies, but he reminds me a little bit of Bob Hoskins in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, who is acting amongst cartoons in that one. Right. Um, it's just the same sort of disposition where they're just... they. It's like they don't acknowledge that they're living within a world that's any different than our own. And so because they just live like they normally would and they act like they would normally act, it just feels so natural. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Very opposite of Ricky Gervais to me in um, Muppets Most Wanted, who it, the whole movie feels like he knows he's talking to the Muppets. Right. He knows that he's talking to puppet characters, which is, you know, I can tell he's happy to be there. But at the same time, it's like he's very much aware of what kind of creatures he's talking to. Unlike Michael Caine and unlike Tim Curry, in my opinion, too. They seem very yeah. like they got into the mindset of like, these are real creatures. These are people that I live with day in and day out. My character lives with and um, it's totally normal. And I totally buy it in both of those movies. Now, like I said, this is just Dickens' Muppet, or this is Dickens' Christmas Carol. There's not really any story beat or character change or anything that's dramatically different from the source material. So when Mm -hmm. we talk character growth, we're basically just talking Scrooge's character growth from the 1800s. But still, I think it's worth exploring as we normally do. Um, Scrooge is just an unpleasant guy, (laughs) right? he's, He's got this unpleasant disposition to the point where at the very beginning of the film, after we've had the whole introductory song, he throws out the customer who's fallen behind on his payments. And it's such the customer is just happy that he didn't get yelled at. Like Mm -hmm. that says a lot about Scrooge as a character from the, uh, from the bat, just without having to say anything, he is glad to be tossed out rather than be yelled at. I mean, wow, that, that says a lot. 
I, yeah, you're absolutely right. I never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. It, it says a lot, like, we don't see him specifically yell at anyone. Well, we do. He, we, he yells at Cratchit later, but all we have to hear is a line like that. Like, thank you for not yelling at me, and, like, we know who this guy is. Like, he's usually pretty ill-tempered and angry and doesn't give a lot of uh, compassion to his fellow man. Um, I also, I know I've heard this line forever, but... I randomly noticed this time around watching it this year that he gives out eviction letters on (laughs) Christmas Day, or at least he was planning to. And I'm just like, that just tells you also so much about this person. He doesn't care about what anyone thinks. He is a businessman through and through. And just, oh, that just, I don't know why I never like noticed that specific little detail. I mean, I knew what he was doing, but it just kind of like really clicked this time around. And I'm just like, gosh, that just shows just what a curmudgeon this guy is. Like, how much you just want to just say, oh, come on, dude, just lighten up. Right. And I mean, the first time we see him smile or laugh or anything, show any kind of joy is when he's expressing the idea uh, that Christmas is foreclosure season and he's right. finding joy in the idea of putting people out of their homes on Christmas Day. It, it's it's just <laughs> wow. Um, so then we get the whole introduction of the Marleys and he's introduced to these spirits one by one. So let's talk about um, his his moments through each of those memories. What about seeing him see the past? What what do you take away from those scenes? Gosh, I mean, it's hard to describe, but it's so interesting watching someone who's so hard and seems to have forgotten the past and then suddenly being confronted by it. And they just seem like they're a child all of a sudden again. Because you'll notice he, like, is he, when he, before he realizes that no one can see him. He's all like, those are my friends. Hello, boys. Hello. And it just shows you right there how eager he is to jump back into his childhood. And it's such a um a quick little switch, but it just shows you so much about him. Like, you know, in the real world, not a lot can, you know, phases him. But then all of a sudden you bring him this man, you know, this broken man back to his childhood. And all of a sudden he's a child again. And just, it shows you that he definitely has a lot worth saving. And he... um definitely you know you can kind of see it coming he's definitely going to have a change especially if you know the story really well but um i think that at that point you want to see the change in him and you want to see him come out for the better because before that you were like oh this guy's grumpy and even when the ghosts were around and told him it was coming you didn't feel too much for him but then all of a sudden you see him in his childhood and it's like oh okay yes i do want to see him become a better man now what's sad to me about the past scenes is knowing that he's always had this sort of disdain for Christmas. He's mm-hmm. nostalgic for the past and he, it's its like he has put it aside and is just suddenly remembering what childhood was like and what his past life was like. But he was always solitary. He was always more focused on schoolwork and reading over spending time with his friends during the holidays. He's never understood right. Christmas. And then flashing forward just a little bit, but still in the past when he's at uh, Fozzie Wigs <laughs> place. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the moment he r- remembers meeting Belle, that's her name, right? Belle? Um, yes, Belle. And the obvious tenderness he views that memory with, even separated by time. And he weeps at what he's lost. He, mm-hmm. he as I said, he, he shut off these memories. He's forgotten them. He's put them aside. All I want to worry about is now and how much money I'm making. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think seeing these memories too, you can see, you also can very much see why he's so um, secluded. And because I think that, you know, it show it, this movie does a great job of showing just how much he's hurt by the past. And I think we all as human beings tend to do that is we just try, we tend to repress things that sadden us or depress us. And I think that they do a great job of showing that, especially when he's confronted with um, his engagement being broken off, you could just see him breaking down like, this is why I am the way I am. I don't want to remember these things. It's really heartbreaking. I think what's most telling is we have the scene at Fozzie Wiggs where he's meeting Belle for the first time. And then the ghost that's with him says, there is another Christmas that you share with this person. And he says, mm-hmm. oh, no, don't show me that one. Like he he knows specifically the Christmas that he's going to see with her. And he dreads it because he knows why he's locked it away. Um, Mm -hmm. before we ever got there. So he's aware of these painful memories in his past, and it's just, they're so painful to him, maybe because um, 
because of his focus on his work. And instead of putting aside his work like he should have and focused on the people around him and Bell and other things like that, he focused on his work harder. And that has become sort of his crutch over the years in locking away everything else. Um, yeah. So he just made himself more miserable over time. And he's seeing the beginnings of that through this confrontation with the ghost of Christmas past. Yeah. But then you get the ghost of Christmas present. And during his song, uh, It Feels Like Christmas, which is one of my favorites from the film, you see Scrooge really starting to get into the spirit. He's smiling at the small things that he's never noticed before, like the mice in the wall, um, mm-hmm. noticing joy in the the people around him who are celebrating the holiday. Uh, it, it's a great moment because you're finally starting to see a little bit of a different Scrooge, even though he hasn't gone on his full journey yet. Yeah, he hasn't, and we'll talk about it later, but we, we he hasn't quite hit the tipping point of his heart being completely changed. But you do see him finally starting to just, you know, get into the spirit a bit more. And again, that makes me really happy because he definitely has his hesitant moments. There's shots of him when the song's going on where he's like, oh, I don't know. But then, you know, he just sees how happy everyone is and how happy the ghost is. And just, and it's funny too, because like, he doesn't talk so so much about why this makes him happy but you don't really need to hear it because you see it you see the joy you see um just this the fulfillment that this um holiday brings even the spirit i mean this spirit is this holiday and uh it's it's just such a be- beautifully done visually i think because we can see it in michael Caine's expressions and we can see it in the atmosphere and just the two melding together and you like you said we're seeing him on his journey we're not quite at the tipping point yet but it definitely is a progression in this scene and in that song he he does become so joyful he even starts dancing at one moment with the ghost he of does. christmas present um it's so and cute. He, right, it is and he he so happy in that moment he says show me somebody who i care about show me kin show me family and so that's when things the, the scale starts to tip yeah. and he sees fred and they're playing the game of yes or no, basically 20 questions. And they start referring to an unwanted creature. And what, who is this unwanted creature? What is this unwanted creature? Is it a mouse? Is it vermin of some kind? What, what might it be? And then they have a laugh over it being discovered that the unwanted creature that his own nephew was talking about was Scrooge mm-hmm. himself. And yeah. he starts to understand the effect that he has on people, even those who love him. He's so curmudgeonly, even the people who love him and stop by his workplace to wish him a Merry Christmas, even those people see him as unwanted in most places. It, it's yeah. really sad. And it's sort of a gut punch to him in that, that moment where his face falls because he understands who and what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you, we can go our whole lives saying we don't care what people think, which I think was definitely the attitude heat that Scrooge has. But Suddenly, when you see the people, like you said, who just care about you even having the same attitude, it just suddenly turns the tables a little bit, you know, makes you have a different perspective. And then from there, the the knife in his heart starts to turn just a little bit more because he goes and he sees Bob Cratchit and his family and little tiny Tim. Now, mm-hmm. what do you have to say <laughs> about that scene? Oh, my God. I cry every time. Oh, gosh. Again, he's seeing the people he cares about and seeing just uh, Bob Cratchit's environment and how he how little he pays and how stern like because, you know, he's always obviously been so stern with how much he pays Bob Cratchit because he's so cheap. But seeing just the difference it could make just by giving him money that he could definitely afford. I, I think that you definitely see that here. But also, for me, the turning point with Scrooge in this film, maybe it's different for other people, but I feel like the moment his heart truly changes is during the song in this scene. And again, so done so visually well. We're just seeing his expressions when, um, when Kermit as Bob Cratchit and Piggy as Mrs. Cratchit and, of course, Robin as Tiny Tim and all their other little kids that were made up for this movie are singing. And... Um, you just see the tears in his eyes, and you and it's it's all in Tiny Tim, pretty much, because of course you know Mrs. Cratchit has her little spiel about how she doesn't like him and everything, which is so understandable. But it's Tiny Tim who I think really changed his heart more than anything, and that was the same thing in the novel. And again, we see that here, and again, I cry every time because it's just 
because Tiny Tim is just such a beautiful soul in this story, and Robin embodies that so well. Because even though um, Tiny Tim knows that he's sick and he knows he might die, he just wants the best for everyone, and clearly has like the greatest faith in humanity. And I, I just know that Scrooge is so touched by that, just from watching Michael Caine change through um, during this song. He becomes sympathetic to mm-hmm. Tiny Tim, but then. He asks the ghost of Christmas present, will Tiny Tim live? Will will he make it through this? And the ghost says, uh, nope, I think he'll die. I see an empty chair and unused crutch in the corner in his future. And then he quotes Scrooge from earlier in the movie and says, and if he's going to die, he better do it and decrease the surplus population. Mm-hmm. And Scrooge realizes what he said in that instance and how heartless it sounded. And just how, and again, the effect that he has on people. And normally I'm not all for the taste of your own medicine kind of plots in movies. But again, it just seems to kind of work in in films like this. Because, you know, it's not like he's literally getting a punch in the face. It's more of just an emotional punch in the face. And <laughs> right. it, yeah, it just, it, it does work very well. And you can see, again, that he just, watching Tiny Tim, he feels helpless now. Because... He's like, I, I'm kind of sort of the cause of this, and I could fix this. And if maybe if I was better to my employer, maybe they would be in a better situation. And then really the sort of the nail in the coffin is when he does meet the ghost of Christmas future, or Christmas <laughs> yet to come. Yeah. And he comes across these people who are celebrating his death, essentially, and pawning off things that they stole from his household because nobody else cares about them. And can we also just talk about how ballsy it was to get rid of Gonzo and Rizzo and not put in any songs and just not sugarcoat anything in these scenes? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely dark for a children's movie. I think it's a very brave choice, but it pays off so well. Yeah, it does. And it's, it's also dark just for a Muppet movie because they yeah. definitely, I don't know why they didn't do things like that in future films or like in Muppet Treasure Island because Muppet Treasure Island was super sugar Cody and it was supposed to be more light and fun, which is fine. But in this movie, they really decided that they had to hit us hard with uh, the reality of Scrooge. And it's again, it blows my mind that they went that route, but I'm so happy that they did. Yeah, even Gonzo says, yeah, we're sort of going to peace out. We'll see you in the finale. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, no, don't abandon me. Uh, and that, that final puppet is, I mean, he's creepy. He basically a grim, grim reaper, as is usually depicted in these films. But uh, mm-hmm. still, it, it it's harrowing. And you see the effect that it has on him. All the, the lighthearted nature of everything is gone. The ghost won't even speak to him. He just vaguely points in general directions. And he sees everything that he fears. He sees being forgotten in death. He sees not being loved by anyone. He sees Tiny Tim being gone officially. And it it changes him. He says, I, I promise that when I wake up, I will uh I will I will be a changed man. I will celebrate Christmas, I will embody the spirit year round, I will give to the poor, I will do this, I will do that. And a lot of times you get you make those promises and you don't mean them. But thankfully with Scrooge, he wakes up after weeping and begging for a, a second chance, and he is a changed man. And mm-hmm. that that whole scene with Thankful Heart, which is another one of my favorite songs from the film, and seeing him touch the lives of all the people he wronged on Christmas Eve, and then all the people he saw during It Feels Like Christmas, and celebrating literally everybody he come, comes across, and making some sort of minor change to their day, whether it's just a block of cheese in the wall for the mice, or... Uh, a shilling or five shillings or however many shillings he gives to the little boy um, bunny. Uh, mm-hmm. What is it? What's his name? Um, Bean bunny. Bean bunny. That's right. Thank you. I had you. to think about it for a second there. Yeah. <laughs> um, g- giving money to bean bunny to go buy the turkey and then finally surprising the Cratchits uh, with this change and with a raised salary and with a paid mortgage and a, thir- uh, a turkey dinner. It- it's so refreshing to see this character who has gone through this ordeal and truly come out on the other side of it changed Mm -hmm. and no matter how many versions you see this one still just seems to shine through so well and it doesn't come off as cliche and it doesn't come off as over the top it just seems to just it just fits so well i like seeing 
Scrooge is demeanor, especially after he has become a changed man. And again, he's not like over the moon excited or anything like to the point where it's like too much. It's just like, again, it feels right. It feels right coming out of Michael Caine that this is a changed man. It's truly joyful. And one of my favorite moments of that that Christmas morning is when he comes across Honeydew and Beaker, who he had yes. spurned earlier in the film as uh, they asked for donations to the poor and the homeless. And he decides to name apparently some sort of ungodly amount because Honeydew and Beaker are both very, very surprised. And they say, thank you for giving so much. I wish we could give something in return. And Beaker, uh, wordlessly for multiple reasons, but just takes <laughs> off his scarf and hands it over to Scrooge, who, despite being a changed man, still looks as brooding and as dark as he did previously. But this red scarf just contrasts completely, lightens his mood, lightens his face, lightens everything about him. And he's just so astounded that he'd receive a gift from anybody. And he's so truly thankful in that moment for a gift. It, it uh, I think that one moment shows how different he is from yeah. the previous day. Yeah. He he just I think he just never really experienced what it was the joy of getting a a, a gift from somebody and he didn't he didn't need a scarf and he didn't need anything in return but just knowing that this is just a, you know, heartfelt gesture. I think yeah, it just really touches him. Now, of course, there are other characters that we don't need to go into quite as much detail. Um, but Bob Cratchit, what do you think of Kermit as Bob Cratchit? I mean, Kermit's just the most lovable character out there to me. I mean, you know, this was um, it was definitely a change in this movie because this was the first big role that Kermit the Frog played since uh, Jim Henson's passing. Mm -hmm. And so this was like one of the first times that audiences were seeing Steve Whitmire's performance of Kermit. And um, I've said before, I'm a huge fan of Steve's Kermit. I know it's very different from Jim Henson's Kermit, but I still always felt like he did a wonderful job of just embodying the soul that uh, that Jim Henson had created for the character. And his Kermit was able to touch so many lives even after Jim's passing and uh, it was definitely a huge undertaking, I think, seeing, um, you know, he, he not only had to be Kermit, he also had to be Kermit being Bob Cratchit. And <laughs> right. uh, so that's a lot right there. And I really applaud um, Steve for taking that on and for it's it's Bob Cratchit. Like Bob Cratchit is just to me, Bob Cratchit is always like a child, but in a a grown man's body and not in a good corny kind of way, but more of like, you know, he tries so hard to please. He also tries so hard to be there for his family and he just tries to see the positive in everything. And that is Kermit. Kermit is so good at seeing the positive in so much. And, um, and it, and let's face it also seeing him actually like pretending to be Miss Piggy's husband <laughs> for a movie <laughs> is actually kind of cute and adorable. <laughs> and, um, yeah, no, I think that Steve did a great job and, and Kermit did a great job um, being Bob Cratchit. Um, I feel like also Bob Cratchit quite often gets the short end of the stick in a lot of these adaptations, but he 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 got to play a big part in this film. And uh, from the very beginning, when we just see him as a humble worker to being a family man to then being a man in mourning, and then also just seeing Kermit be afraid of um, Ebenezer Scrooge at the very end of the movie. It's kind of it's it's actually kind of funny because it's very Kermit. He he wants so badly to please, and Kermit does that quite a bit too. And uh, no, Kermit as Bob Cratchit was incredible. The casting in this movie in general is amazing. It's like perfect casting. The, if you're gonna add adapt a tale with Muppets, I honestly to me this is like one of the best ones, which is such a surprise because normally Muppets are so silly, but this just seems to work so well for the Muppets. Yeah, speaking to Steve Whitmire's Kermit, uh, Steve Whitmire was the Kermit that I grew up with. I mean, this mm -hmm. movie released in 92. That's when I was born. And Muppet Treasure Island was my favorite as a kid. And then going all the way through the most recent Muppets films and the TV show, uh, that's the Kermit that I know best. I've gone back and I've watched the Jim Henson stuff. And I've seen snippets of, uh, goodness, who's playing Kermit now? Um, now it's Matt Vogel. Matt Vogel, that's right. Uh, I, I've seen snippets of Matt Vogel as Kermit recently, 
uh, on like Dancing with the Stars, stuff like that. But Steve Whitmire has always been my Kermit. He'll always be my Kermit. And I love him in this movie, in any movie he plays Kermit. He's great. Um, and as Bob Cratchit, he's so joyful despite his work situation with Mr. Scrooge and the additional hardships of his home life with Tiny Tim and a large family that he struggles to feed. He's thankful for what he has, though. And even though it's not much, he he blesses Scrooge as the giver of the feast. Despite mm-hmm. his low income, he blesses Scrooge and raises a glass to Scrooge. And then when Tiny Tim is gone in the uh, shadow of what the future may be, there's sadness there's tears, but there's still also thankfulness in this family for what they had in Tiny Tim. Yeah. And I think that says a lot about Bob Cratchit as a character. It says a lot about Kermit as a character, even though he's playing a different role. It's, as you said, very Kermit in general. It is. And I think that, again, Kermit, to me, has always been a character who just tries to see the best in everyone and the best in every situation. And there's a great moment in that scene, too, in the future when he you can tell like once they've all sat down to dinner he's very hesitant and sad to say this but he tries to lighten the mood by saying life is full of meetings and partings and we'll never forget this parting among us and you can tell he's trying so hard to uplift everybody but then you also see in his expression that he's sad too about the passing of his son and Again, that whole thing is just so Kermit because no matter how hard it is, he tries so hard to just lift people's spirits. And again, very Bob Cratchit, very Kermit. Perfect casting. (laughs) And Tiny Tim is just an extension of his father. He, when we first meet him, he says he went to church to remind people who it was that made the lame walk. Mm -hmm. And in his short life, he suffered many hardships but he's still joyful and caring just like his dad is. And that's what wins Scrooge over when looking at Tiny Tim is how he faces his life and his situation with optimism, despite really not having a lot of reason to be so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have Fred who just like Bob Cratchit is joyful and is very involved in the spirit of the season and he donates to the poor and the homeless without having much money for himself and he's optimistic in the face of Scrooge's pessimism and cruelty he's like the human version of Bob Cratchit in this movie yeah a little bit and then you do have uh Dickens or Gonzo and Rizzo and as I already mentioned that they're my favorite pair and all of the Muppets and uh, I wish we had more of them and all the way throughout they are our main source of comedy where we have physical gags and getting knocked off of balconies by opening windows and uh, Gonzo (laughs) knowing everything, getting set on fire. Yeah, they're they're so much fun. I love Gonzo and Rizzo and them working as narrators that are sort of in the background, but are also affected by what's going on, um, like opening windows. They make me laugh every time as well. They do. And they seem to just kind of be invisible for the most part, too. Like, they could get tossed out a window and nobody notices. <laughs> right. The only time they're really acknowledged is at the end when uh, Scrooge comes up and wishes them a Merry Christmas by patting them on the heads. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, oh, just a couple of characters I want to mention and not really talk about. Fozzie mm-hmm. as Fozzie Wig is oh so perfect. <laughs> Again, so perfect. There's that that pun is everything right there. And I... And, uh, I, I, I don't feel like um, Fezziwig from the original um, book and other adaptations always gets much of a, a a part in a lot of adaptations. To be honest, I don't know how much of a part he plays in the book because I still have not read the book, which is terrible. I so badly want to read the book and I should this year. But he always just is kind of like, the, oh, yeah, that's the nice happy guy that I used to work for. But here it's Fozzie and Fozzie's the jokester and he's the opposite of Scrooge in so many ways and Fozzie just embodies that so well he's just even though he's terrible at jokes which they also you know um show us in this movie he just is just happy and he he gets so into the spirit of Christmas and just wants to throw a party and just wants to be a good man and he wants to just entertain his friends and that's so Fozzie and (laughs) it's, it's it's such a great part for him to play and then possibly my favorite cameo is Sam the Eagle as <laughs> as Scrooge's <laughs> old school teacher. And yeah. he says, it is the American way. Or 
it is the British way <laughs> because yeah. they're in London. <laughs> and Sam the Eagle has always been uh, the gung-ho for America. It's a salute to all nations, but mostly America character. <laughs> and I, I just love having that that little tiny moment of breaking the fourth wall where he says American instead of British after, uh, and then Gonzo corrects him and he says the correct thing. Right. And putting Sam in this movie to me is the exact embodiment that this is Christmas Carol, but they just threw Muppets in there. And mm-hmm. again, that could have backfired and it could have worked not well, but for some reason it does. And they didn't need Sam to be in the scene. They didn't need that cameo. But for whatever reason, throwing him in right there just totally works. Like like you said, he's your favorite cameo. Why do you think that is? Um, Because I, I love Sam the Eagle. I have a <laughs> shirt of him uh, dressed as Captain America. And yeah. it, it's like a comic book cover. And it has that quote, salute to all nations, but mostly America. Mostly America. And uh, <laughs> I, I just, I love him in this. I love him in Muppet Treasure Island as Mr. Errol. Mm-hmm. Um, he, Errol? Arrow? Uh, Mr. I, Errol? Yeah. Yeah, Arrow? yeah. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I never remember if it's Errol or Arrow, but. It that's sounds beside, like Arrow, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll have to look that up later. Yeah, um, but, oh, those Brits and their names. <laughs> but Sam the Eagle is just so in your face all the time and it, it it's funny that he has that that one little pun in this well not even a pun it's just a, a reference to himself outside of the film right <laughs> and, then, like and the, a, it's such a great little fourth wall break because again they were like hey go do this part sam and then like he just gets so into it that he forgets that he's supposed to be british <laughs> right and it's then... like the one character who accidentally breaks character yeah exactly <laughs> which is so <laughs> funny about it too <laughs> Uh, any other characters you wanted to mention, or uh, I'm trying to remember if there are any specifics. Um, well, I do love the Marley brothers because, of course, mm-hmm. we have never seen two Marleys. We've only seen one ever, but for some reason, turning uh, Marley into both Statler and Waldorf really works because they're hecklers and they come right. in to heckle <laughs> to heckle Scrooge. I'm like that just fits so well, I think. And then it's also really kind of cool because I don't think i had never seen this in another adaptation but i think it's really cool that we're in the scenes of the past we see the marley brothers as you know alive and younger men and again they're just heckling fozzy and they even go through the effort of putting them on a balcony like in the muppet show (laughs) um it's 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 so funny just seeing Marley as an actual person and seeing him in his life and seeing that you know he was kind of cruel but he was also in on some level kind of likable just like Scrooge was back then and then they became you know jerks but it's nice to know that when they were younger they were jokesters but you know they were kind of fun to be around as well. Yeah, they're they're another great example of finding characters that just fit very well. I can't think of who else they would have gotten to play Marley, uh, but having two Marleys and having them be the the classic hecklers of the Muppets, just, if it's a perfect fit. Yeah, I mean, maybe Uncle Deadly, but, I mean, yeah. that would have been more creepy. Unc- See, now, I feel like if they made Christmas Carol down the line, the ghost of Christmas future would have probably been Uncle Deadly. You uh-huh. know, it's a kind of goof a pot uh, excuse me to kind of like you know goof it up a little bit but but they didn't do that which i think was really smart and um yeah i think sweetums could have been uh, a good ghost whether it was maybe christmas future or christmas yet to come he just like pulls down the hood and all of a sudden it's sweetums <laughs> <laughs> i don't know yeah um but uh let's go ahead and move on to music uh, what are some of your favorite of the songs that's so hard because some of the songs are so good in this movie. If I had to pick one song that was my absolute favorite, probably um, my I think my favorite has got to be Bless Us All because um, it's just so touching. And again, it makes me cry every time I watch it. Um, I mean, I get so many great songs in this movie. Um, look, Beginning to Look Like Christmas, I think, is like um, a strong second because you just feel the embodiment of Christmas in that song. But but it's that touching moment because it's not just the sweetness of the song. It's also to just, again, watching Michael Caine as Scrooge just change in that moment just by seeing him watch this family. And, of course, Robin singing is adorable. And Yeah. Yeah. They're just they're, like you said earlier, too. It's just watching this family just be so grateful even though they have so little. And and also just the way that the, the scene is shot and how um, – the lighting is and everything it just is almost glowing kind of and it just fits Mm -hmm. the music so well 
if I had to pick one song in this whole movie, probably Bless Us All. And um, yeah, and then um, Feels Like Christmas is a very close second. Okay. Um, so, so what's interesting for me, as I said, I didn't grow up on this movie. And so there's really not any of the songs in this one that are classic to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I like them all. But when I think of this movie, there really aren't any songs that immediately come to mind like I associate it with them. Whereas if I think of Muppet Treasure Island, I could sing along to every single song, every <laughs> word almost, uh, just because that was that was the one I grew up with, whereas I didn't with this one. But you know, that's that's the opposite for me. Like, I feel like I could sing along with all the songs in Christmas Carol, but um, up at Treasure Island, I feel like I'd stumble on the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, that, it's funny how we experience things differently. Uh, mm-hmm. um, but that being said, my favorite songs are One More Sleep Till Christmas, I think it's called, which is the one that Bob sings after Scrooge has left the workplace mm-hmm. for the day. And they break into song because their boss, their curmudgeonly crotchety boss is gone and they can express some joy and express some Christmas spirit. And uh, despite only having one day off and having meager pay and not having a lot of money or warmth or anything that they should have in a, a nice work situation, they still are joyful and excited for the holiday. And plus we get the rats. And, and plus, antics. we get the rats, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which was which is not too much and not too little. I like I really like the rats in this movie in the first part, and they're very very funny. Like uh, when they they're asking for more coal because they're cold and they're they've got pensicles or whatever. Their assets and, are frozen, <laughs> right? And then Scrooge <laughs> says, "How would it feel uh, on the unemployed list?" And they the next time we see them, they're dressed in like luau outfits and yeah they're pretending it's, just little it's warm things, <laughs> it's little things like that that you know i i like the what i like so much about this movie is that they don't go too silly like and again usually that's fine for muppets but i think that because in the spirit of um christmas carol they have those moments where they can be silly but then they know when to not be silly and i like that we get just a little dosage of rats and we didn't need to see them through the whole movie because I feel like that would have gotten annoying after a while. But just getting them there at the very beginning when, you know, they're trying to get the uh, trying to get more pay or get more coal. And then when they're expressing their joy for Christmas, like that was just enough. And I really, really appreciate them adding that, but also not going too over the top with them. Then as uh, another favorite is It Feels Like Christmas, mm-hmm. which you already talked about. So I don't want to go too de- too in depth with that. But then A Thankful Heart is probably my top song. Um, I think it's the one that gets stuck in my head most when I watch the film is Michael Caine singing a thankful heart at the end mm-hmm. um, because it does show the joy and the change that it, he's gone through. And uh, it's just a, a happy moment and everybody's getting swept up in it and he's drawn this big crowd and they're traveling through the city because everybody's happy and everybody's connected. And it, it's just a sweet song. Mm-hmm. Then uh, do you have anything to say about the instrumental score by Miles Goodman? Just that it's so christmasy um Mm -hmm. i I love it's lovely it's so beautiful the intro music um with the tubas and the horns and everything like you don't normally hear that kind of stuff throughout the year but for some reason they included those instruments and that just made it sound very christmasy like you know when you're walking downtown with the lights and everything and then you hear that band just singing christmas songs off in the uh in the corner somewhere like that's kind of what that reminds me of and and again just uh they're in the very beginning the the overture there's um they're playing the song um looks like looking like christmas and of course we associate that with it as a very christmasy song but just the beat of it sounds very christmasy and um yeah just really really um smart instrumental choices i think because those instruments like i said you don't hear those a lot throughout the year but you do hear them at christmas time a lot and hearing them with that beat just it feels like christmas pun intended (laughs) it you mentioned the sort of street ensemble feel of it, which is something that I was going to mention too. So I'm really glad you pointed it out. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, it's it's sort of a thinly orchestrated score. It, it's not. It doesn't sound like a huge orchestra, mm-hmm. and it does give it that feel of like a street ensemble playing on the corner. Yeah. Or, or maybe even just a smaller orchestra that you might see in the time period. I don't know. Or yeah. Maybe like a small community group. Um, it, that that's the feeling that I get from the score is it, it's a smaller ensemble of people just uh, celebrating the good time good times together and playing good Christmas music together. Uh, we even get an instrumental version of Good King Wenceslas in there. That's right. Um, that's right. Yeah, we do. Yeah, it, it's very Christmassy. It's very peaceful. It's small in scope, but that doesn't 
take away from its beauty. I think the the smaller scope is intentional for sure. Yeah. Less is more. Yeah. Right. Um, well, let's go ahead and go on to our sort of final section, uh, the takeaways of the film. What's some of your takeaways? Gosh, um, how do you even describe that into words? I mean, this movie to me is Christmas. It's, you know, not just because of the movie itself, but because I've watched this, I'm, I think, every year since I, as long as I can remember. So it just wouldn't be Christmas without this movie. Um, I so deeply appreciate how respectful that they were to this source material because, again, they could have totally gone silly with it because it's like, oh, it's Muppet Christmas Carol and Muppets. Let's just have some fun and be silly. But again, they know so well when to be silly and when to be serious and when to bring in the heartfelt moments. And um, I just think that that because of that, the spirit of the original source material really shines through. They, they, it, it mm-hmm. gives them a chance to really absorb the, the themes and um, what you can take away from it. Because the, one of the reasons I think this story is so powerful in general is because, you know, we can see ourselves in Scrooge and seeing this movie or even reading the book can really change a person. And you, like, you can see like, oh, that's me. That's how I treat people. Maybe I should become a better person. Or you can see yourself in characters like, you know, Bob Cratchit or even Tiny Tim. And my, I guess my biggest takeaway from this is that I just love how well this captures that story and captures the themes of appreciating life and appreciating uh, the people around you and just being a nice person in general. Because this movie so much makes you want to be a nice person. <laughs> like if you have a bad day and you watch this movie, you're just like, aw. I, I want to go help people now. And um, so, so how would you describe all in, you know, one sentence what I take away from it? Because I think I feel like I take away what so many people take away from it. But what it makes it more magical, I guess, to me is that it has the Muppets, the characters that are usually known for being silly and just making it so touching because the Muppets are really good at doing that. They can make things really touching and they can make things that really touch your heart and Again, this is something that could have totally backfired, but it just works in the most amazing way. And it just never disappoints me watching this movie. Agreed with all of that. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) As as far as like specific lessons or specific themes, I thought it would be interesting to break it down into the three ghosts. Because, I mean, there's a reason Scrooge is visited by past, present, and future. Right. And so the the takeaways from each I thought would be interesting to explore real quick. Okay. So our, the influence of the past on us. We can't change decisions we've made in the past. They are part of who we are. And if we forget them, if we forget those choices we've made and how our mistakes might have affected us now, then we don't learn from them. And so the the goal is to remember them, learn from them, and grow from them. Mm-hmm. And that's what Scrooge had to learn from visiting the past is growing from learning lessons from mistakes you may have made. Then we have the future or the present, our influence on the lives of people around us. Um, as Scrooge sees, giving Bob a small salary means that Bob struggles to properly take care of his large family. He's got four kids and a wife, and they're struggling to get through they have a goose on the the fire that's not necessarily a super hearty meal mm-hmm. um now we don't necessarily hand out salaries to people but what we say or do to other people goes home with them at the end of the day it doesn't exist in a vacuum what we do in one place doesn't stay in that one place as much as you want, want to leave something in vegas it doesn't necessarily right. stay in vegas <laughs> Um, so we want to make sure that the things we say or do to other people bring them joy and happiness in their lives rather than pain, sorrow, hardship, depression, whatever it might be. So there's that one. And then the third one is our influence on the future. The choices we make every day can either change or preserve the future that is laid before us. And so our goal and what we should do and strive for every day is to make the choices that will make our future and the futures of those around us fruitful. And that, that, that was my sort of breakdown of what we should take away from 
a Christmas Carol in general. Not necessarily just the Muppet Christmas Carol, but Christmas Carol. That that is my takeaway. Absolutely. And then finally, just the notion that every day is a gift. I mean, look at Tiny Tim, who has so little and who is lame, and he has to approach every day as a gift because his future is unknown. But he's still thankful, and we need to be thankful for what we have and celebrate each day anew. And that's basically all I have. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> well Any final thoughts? I, I couldn't have said it better myself. That is Christmas Carol, and that's... I think what Charles Dickens wanted to teach us. And it's such an important thing also to remember those kinds of things around this time of year, because, you know, not only is it Christmas, this is a time when we need to be, you know, good to people, but also because it's a good time to reflect on what's happened to us this past year and what are we going to do to be better people in the next year. And also, of course, just celebrating this time that you have with the people that you care about. So this is like, I'm suddenly realizing this is like the perfect story for this time of year. It is. And it's it's a stressful time of year, too, especially nowadays yeah. where there's so much pressure on buying gifts for people and being here for this event and being there for that event. And sometimes a smile from a stranger or from a friend or whoever it might be that can make or break somebody's day. If mm -hmm. you don't do it, it could break it. If you do it, I mean, that that could turn a, a negative situation into a more positive one because it, it gives you a new outlook. Yeah. So yeah. with that, I think that is the end of the official 69th episode of Cinescope. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, Rachel. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Contact for the show. You can find us facebook.com slash Cinescope Podcast and at Cinescope Pod on Twitter. Please consider going over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts on your iOS device. Rate, review, subscribe. If you have any feedback or ideas for the show, email thecinescopepodcast at gmail.com. And if you're interested in co-hosting like Rachel just did, if you have a movie you love, feel like you could talk about it for a little bit, let me know. And I'd love to get you on in the new year. Now, Rachel, where can people find you and your work online? Sure, absolutely. Um, on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash adorkablerachel. And I'm also running a vlog channel that will soon be more active, youtube.com slash theadorkablevlog. And if you want to find me on social media, just about everything out there, my username is adorkablerachel, just one word, except for on Twitter, which is adorkablerach, R-A-C-H. And also, just so you know, when you spell my name, it's R-A-C-H-E-L. There is no extra A in there, so there's no confusion. You don't need that extra A. No, <laughs> I got all the A's I need. Right. The best place to find me is at Chadadada on Twitter. That is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. -A -D -A -D -A. And then also Facebook.com slash Chad.Hopkins. And you can listen to my other podcast, An American Workplace, where we talk about NBC's The Office. We're reaching the end of season three, or we're about midway through season three right now. And you can find that where podcasts can be found and at the website workplacepodcast.com. And I should mention, I don't know if you mentioned it, I might have missed it. Don't forget, Rachel is on Mouse Music with Sideshow Sound Radio. Uh, we've had those people on before, Wendell, uh, Ian, and Will. <laughs> oh goodness, I forgot for just a moment. No worries. Uh, so go check, go go check them out over Sideshow Sound Radio. Found find Mouse Music where they talk about all things Disney. Um, and then for this show, you can find show notes, contact information at, at the website thecinescopepodcast.com. And that is all for this week. Thank you once again, Rachel. It's great talking to you again about the Muppets. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for listening to episode 69. I'm Chad Hopkins. This was Cinescope, and we'll be back next week with episode 70. Have fun and celebrate movies. That's it. Yay. Wonderful. That was awesome.